Welcome everybody to my Finance Road Trip Podcast Part 2, The Black Wall Street Tour, where I take you on my journey alongside Naja Roberts as we travel around the entire country educating our communities on cryptocurrency and the evolution of money. My name is Charles J. Kelly, also known as CJ the Smart Guy. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify and check out my content. I am a certified public accountant based in California. That's where my license is. That's also where I'm originally from. However, I live in Houston, Texas. I take advantage of the no state taxes here in Texas. I graduated from the illustrious Texas Southern University back in 2013 with both finance and accounting degrees. Upon graduating, I took a job in Fort Worth as an accountant for the railroad, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway, which is a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway. At that time, BNSF was the biggest purchase that B- that Berkshire had ever done. And so I was actually doing the accounting essentially for Warren Buffett. Um, he got to see the financial statements that I created. He started, he looked at the numbers that I created. And so after working there for three years, I said, you know what? If I'm good enough to do this for a billionaire, I can go ahead and do this for myself. And so I left my job after only three years and started studying for my, my CPA license. In 2017, Um, is when I first started to uh, pass my exams. And along that, around that time, that's the same time where Dr. Boyce Watkins and Nipsey Hussle encouraged me to start um, looking into cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. So I was studying for my CPA, creating my own business, as well as studying cryptocurrency all at the same time. And around, around June, 2020, all the way through December, 2020 is when it all came together. And so I'm going to take you on the journey from about 20 different cities, from Houston all the way up to Chicago and Detroit, all the way down to Tulsa and to Miami, um, alongside Naja Roberts. This is my second tour around the country. My first tour happened at the end of 2019. Um, I went solo, and that's when my first podcast was created. However, the content was atrocious. Um, in the sense that the the quality was really bad. I didn't really know what I was doing. The things I said were really great. There were lots of gems in it. Um, However, the quality is really bad. I never released all the different episodes because I can never make it work. However, this time I will make it work. I got my equipment set up, so we're good to go. Um, And so I'm gonna give you a little background. This episode is gonna be called, um, what is cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and how does it affect me? Um, And so that's what I'm gonna give you. So Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency is essentially digital money. It's not backed by any government. It's not backed by any um, centralized entity. It is digital money that's backed by math, algorithms, and something called the blockchain. The blockchain is the technology behind it. Blockchain is changing the entire world, whether we realize it or not. It's changing the money. Is changing supply chains and even if you look at COVID-19 it's doing the blockchain tracing for the different people who have caught COVID or whatnot and so when we look at cryptocurrency it's been around since I believe 2009 um, you can look at the white papers the white paper is what describes what Bitcoin is doing and essentially is going against the banks um, so in, in here in America around 2007 to 2009 the banks caused a mortgage crisis by giving subprime loans to people who didn't qualify for it, and they were backing it by a whole bunch of junk um, investments that they shouldn't have been investing in. And so by them doing a lot of this bad practice, some of it being a legal activity, it created a, a downfall for the rest of the country, and a lot of people, including myself, were, were negatively affected. And so somebody called Nakamoto Satoshi, whom that's just a pseudonym. We don't really know who the person or the group is. Um, somebody named Na- Nakamoto Satoshi created this, this thing called Bitcoin, which is essentially digital money that's backed by the blockchain. And it was put into place in 2009. And here we are in 2001. And it's going stronger than ever. So only 12 years into this thing. And so what I like to tell people is, Think of the blockchain as an upgrade from the internet. The internet was essentially created around 1983. And so 12 years later, we're looking at 1995. So think about 1995 and what you could have invested in 
when it comes to the internet. And that's what you could be investing now into this blockchain. And also when you look at the stock market to this day, you can look at the top five, six stocks. You got Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alibaba, and they're all based on, off the internet. So in my mind, if you have the next version of the internet, which is blockchain, chances are a lot of these companies are gonna get overtaken by this new technology. And so that's where I come with it. Um, me being an, an accountant, that's how I got involved with Naja Roberts. So I was studying for my CPA exam. Um, you can check out my podcasts called My Journey um, to Becoming a CPA as well as, well as my journey um, with cryptocurrency on my Entrepreneur Period um, podcast um, where I talk more in depth about my different journeys. But I essentially, I got my cryptocurrency, I mean, I got my, my CPA license in June of 2020. And by December 2020, I was on this app called Clubhouse. Clubhouse is essentially like a, a public speaking uh, platform where, you know, you have a, an audience, you have people that are that can listen to you. Um, and if they press a button, they can raise their hand, you can bring them on the stage and they can ask you a question. It's just like a public speaking event. You can have a panel, you can have um, one person speaking, you could have, you know, however the setting you want, but it gives you the control just like a public speaking event. If somebody gets out of hand, you can send them back to the audience or you can, you know, block them from even coming in. And so I was on Clubhouse and a lot of people were asking about the tax side of cryptocurrency. And uh, I'd already had my CPA license. I was already familiar with cryptocurrency, but I never actually put the two together um, in the sense that I didn't know I was going to be specializing in cryptocurrency taxes. I just knew both languages. Um, and so when I was studying for the CPA exam, um, cryptocurrency wanted to be coming on it after I started studying it. So I was actually ahead of the CPA exam when it came to cryptocurrency. And so me being on Clubhouse, there was a group called the Black Bitcoin Billionaires, which was started by um, Lamar Wilson, as well as Isaiah Jackson. So a little background on them. Um, Lamar Wilson is a developer who um, was recommended by Dr. Boyce Watkins. So while I'm in corporate America, um, I'm listening to Dr. Boyce Watkins. He tells about this cryptocurrency stuff. He's trying to teach us to get off the corporate plantation. And so he teaches us or he introduces us to a man named Lamar Wilson, who's a developer. He had created some, he had created a group called Coinda on Facebook. And so I was learning about, you know, the tech side of this cryptocurrency because I already understood the finance side to it. But then there's a tech side, which is actually more important. The finance is just a byproduct of the technology. So I was learning a little bit about the technology from Lamar Wilson and then Isaiah Jackson, the author of Bitcoin and Black America. Um, I had bought his book. I believe in September 2020 and when I read it you know I was in full agreement with the things he was saying when he was talking about the banks and the malpractice of the banks and you know he gave a really good you know book version of cryptocurrency and it basically outlined a plan for the black community to get together and more than anything else what I appreciate about the book is the directory at the back and so when I read the, the book I went to the directory and I started following everybody that was um, in the directory on social media because it was a bunch of black people who were involved in the space and at that time I didn't realize it was that many people. I thought it was maybe just me, maybe just Lamar and a couple of us. I thought it was only maybe like 20, 30 of us in the country that were thinking about this stuff. I didn't realize how big it was going to become. Um, well, maybe I realized it, but I just didn't think it was going to happen so quickly. Um, and so when I read that book, I went to the directory, followed everybody on social media and Next, you know, when I'm on Clubhouse, some of these people that were on Twitter or on Instagram or on LinkedIn were all of a sudden listening to me and we're having dialogue. And so, you know, December 2020, my life changes because of Clubhouse. You know, tax season begins the early February of 2021. And next, you know, I'm the cryptocurrency accountant for, you know, seemingly black America, which is an extreme honor. I'm humbled, honored to be a part of that. And so... I want to now give you guys, you know, some tax information when it comes to cryptocurrency, because that's what I'm known as. Um, and so one of the strategies that we use in the crypto world is to buy and hold, because if you buy cryptocurrency, if you hold on to it, 
um, you, you, neither one of those are a taxable event. So there's no taxes on buying or holding. If you ever need, um, if you ever need some US dollars cash and you don't want to sell your cryptocurrency, you can always borrow against it. So bar, so buying, holding, or borrowing against cryptocurrency is not taxable. However, if you sell it, if you trade it for another cryptocurrency, or you buy goods and services with cryptocurrency, those all create taxable events because cryptocurrency as of right now, it's all treated under one umbrella as property. So um, say if you buy your buy something January 1st, 2020, and you sell it before January 1st, 2021, meaning you held it for less than a year, you are taxed at a short term capital gains rate, which means that you know, however much you made on that on that sale, that would get added to your ordinary income. So if you make fifty thousand a year and then you you bought Bitcoin and sold it and made another ten thousand, now you've made sixty thousand that year. However, if you hold it for longer than a year, then you're taxed the more favorable capital gains rate. Um, because in this country you are taxed less if your money makes money for you than you are if you spend your time to go ahead and make money. Most people don't know that. Um, so also, if you guys can go to a website called you.sunjoin.com, I am creating my classes on there um, where I talk more in depth about these different strategies, accounting, what is accounting, um, what is cryptocurrency, what is the tax implications of it. I just go more in depth. My goal is to create an entire school um, so that you know we can be educated on this because most of the stuff is not taught in school. The majority of the stuff doesn't make sense intentionally. And unless you are taking CPE, which is like continuing profession education um, as a CPA, the rules change every year. So you're probably not going to catch on to it. Um, and so that's what I do. That's what I pride myself on. I'm always studying the new laws and regulations um, to keep myself on that. So if you go to u.sunjoin.com, I'm in the process of creating my entire school um, for accounting. Um, so, yeah. So there's a couple of tidbits. Um, we like to buy our cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoin, hold it and never sell it. If you ever need US dollars, you can borrow against it. I actually use this myself because um, I've been buying Bitcoin since 2017. I did not want to get rid of my cryptocurrency, but I needed some money um, in February 2021 to take on the, the volume that I was no, now getting for my tax business. And so um, there's multiple platforms. Um, I personally, I'd use Nexo, but they also have Celsius, BlockFi. Um, those are different platforms where you can give them your custody of your cryptocurrency and they can give you the US dollars. Upon talking to Lamar Wilson, um, he was explaining to us on the tech side that if you don't um, hold your, your private keys, then you don't own your coin. So Isaiah, he says something called no keys, no cheese, meaning if you don't own your private keys, you don't own your cryptocurrency. So Lamar was kind of against me, you know, giving my cryptocurrency to Nexo in order to get a US dollar, because if the exchange gets hacked, if something happens and Europe or America decides to make cryptocurrency illegal, they can take my um, scarce asset, which is Bitcoin, because there's only 21 million Bitcoins to ever be created. Um, if they take that, then they can give me the US dollar equivalent of it, maybe, but I don't get my scarce asset back. And so another platform that might be able to sidetrack that is Unchained Capital, where you can use like two-step verification in order to not pay, or in, in order to not give up your private keys. But those are just some, some of the small strategies, buy, hold, borrow against none of those create taxable events um, however if you sell it trade it or if you buy goods and services with it you do create a capital event uh, a capital tax event if you hold it for under a year it's added to your ordinary income if you hold it for longer than a year then it's taxed the more favorable rate and the way that you could determine um, what bitcoin that you're selling because it is considered fungible meaning all bitcoin is the same so if you decide to sell it, you can actually choose the days that you bought it, which ones that you're selling. So you could have bought it yesterday, sold the one from yesterday, or you could have sold one from, you know, two years ago when you first started buying. And that's called specific identification. 
So if you're looking for a CPA in this cryptocurrency space and they don't understand specific identification, they're not the CPA for you. Um, most CPAs are running away from cryptocurrency because they don't understand it. However, it is becoming legitimate because for the first time ever on your 1040 tax return for 2020, it basically asks, don't, it's not the exact quote, but it's basically, have you done any buying, selling, trading, or done any transactions or acquired any cryptocurrency, um, virtual currency, cryptocurrency, same type of thing. And if you hit no and you actually have, then that is considered fraudulent. Um, and the IRS, they're doing something called Operation Hidden Treasures, where they're going back from 2016 to 2020 to see if people have paid their taxes on their cryptocurrency. They're using exchanges such as Coinbase um, to be able to look at, okay, they KYC, KYC meaning know your customer, meaning you've given the exchange your social security number. Um, you have to give it to them so that they know that you're not a fraudster or a money launderer or you know America's most wanted list or something like that. Um, but they also will send information to the IRS letting them know, hey, this person had a transaction of more than $10,000. Um, and so the, the IRS now they're doing these investigations from 2016 to 2020. And you have a lot of people who um, have made a lot of money and haven't paid any tax in this space because 10 years ago when Bitcoin was first getting started, this was it wasn't really considered um, money it wasn't really considered even a big deal and so now it is a becoming a big deal um, actually Joe Biden just added 80 billion dollars to the IRS to target uh, cryptocurrency investors specifically people who um, who have made more than twenty thousand dollars in the space um, and so my job as a as a CPA um, as well as somebody in the community is to help bring that knowledge to us so that we're not you know, getting the, the field agents knocking at our doors saying, hey, you owe us taxes. And so that's my role into this. I love educating the communities. Um, that's why when Naja said she was going on tour, I was like, man, let me uh, let me come on tour with you. Um, and it worked out magnificently. I went to about 20 different cities. Um, every single episode in this podcast will cover a different city, um, my different experiences with there, some of the history in it. Um, some of the pros, some of the cons, some of the future um, plans that we might do going forward um, and things of that nature. And so me being a cryptocurrency CPA, I'm loving it. If you are trying to become a CPA, understand that less than 1% of CPAs are black. So we need more CPAs. Um, I know as black people in this country, uh, you know, Biden just said um, on national news that you know, ideas are great. I mean, our black ideas are great, but we don't have lawyers and doctors and CPAs and things of that nature. Well, I'm a CPA. I'm here. I'm here to educate our communities. And so, yeah, make sure you reach out to me on Instagram or on Twitter at CJ the Smart Guy, as well as on Clubhouse. Every Monday, we do a, a, a Genesis block with the Black Bitcoin Billionaires Group, uh, Black, black B Bitcoin Billionaires Club, where we talk about all the current news. And so some of the current news that's going on right now in this crypto space is that El Salvador just made Bitcoin legal tender in their country. I don't know how that's going to play out. I don't know how the U.S. is going to react to that. All I know is that a lot of these small countries that have been dealing with hyperinflation due to COVID, even some of these countries before COVID were dealing with hyperinflation, they are now looking at Bitcoin as a saving grace because let's explain the history of money. A lot of the stuff I learned from Naja Roberts um, on tour. But, you know, if we think about what is money, money is just represents value. Before we had paper money, we had the barter system where, you know, if you if you had some chickens and I had some cows, we might make a deal. Hey, 100 chickens for a cow or something like that. And that's how the deals would be done. But sometimes that's not always convenient because what if I just want a couple eggs and all I have to offer is a cow. You know, what if that cow is not producing milk? You know, it can create some issues with the barter system. And so from the barter system, we moved to a monetary system. Um, monetary, meaning at the time it was silver, then it changed to gold. Um, and so we used a gold standard. But if, you, if you've heard of fool's gold, you know, that wasn't a perfect system either. Sometimes the, you know, the balance or the scale would be off. 
and sometimes it wouldn't be pure gold it wouldn't be pure silver so there was issues with that as well um but here in the united states in 1913 um, a group of individuals got together on a, an island called jekyll and they came together to say hey we're going to basically rule the financial world um, here in america as well as the entire the entire globe um, and they created something called the federal reserve so the Federal Reserve is not a federal entity. It's no more federal than, you know, Federal Express that delivers your packages. Shout out to Naja Roberts. She gave me that one. Um, but yeah, so the Federal Reserve is not a federal entity. Um, it's really owned by the the grandfathers of the banks like Chase, you know, Chase, J.P. Morgan, um, Wells Fargo, Douche Bank, all the, all the grandfathers from these different banks, they own the Federal Reserve. And they created that in 1913. Well, 20 years later, 1933, you know, America was at war and they essentially said, hey, look, we need all the gold. Um, and so they made it illegal to hoard gold in America. So holding on to your gold became illegal. And so everybody had to turn it into the Federal Reserve, which to me is crazy. But they did give you, you know, some type of compensation. They said, OK, well, look, we'll give you the silver half dollar. So if you guys ever dealt with your grandmas or you know got older family members with the silver you know the silver half dollars that's what they did they said okay we're going to give you precious metal that represents a certain value for what's at the federal reserve but we're not going to let you hold on to the gold itself or the silver or whatnot and so um fast forward from 20 from 1933 um to you know 1971 uh essentially Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. Why? Because all the gold that the Federal Reserve had taken from the American people somehow came up missing. Um, and so if it's gone missing, then the the U.S. currency can't be backed by gold because the gold is missing now. Um, which is crazy to me that, you know, gold comes up missing in the Federal Reserve. Um, it's supposed to be in Fort Knox. But anyway... So now that it's it's gone, um, a few years later, they then say, okay, now you can hold on to your gold again, um, which to me is very, very interesting. So it's no longer illegal. It hasn't been illegal since I think like 1975 to, to have your gold. But what they did was they gave people, you know, the US dollar equivalent of their cryptocurrency, of, of their, of their, um, of their assets such as gold. So they say, here, we're going to give you a depreciating asset in this paper money or in this these coins, and we're going to take your actual scarce asset in gold. And so I believe back then, I think an ounce of gold was going for like $26. Now it's going for almost 2000 And so it's like the purchasing power for that half dollar back then is still just a half dollar to this day. Maybe you could say, well, okay, it's gone up by a couple dollars. But either way, it hasn't gone up from 20 to 2,000. And so with that being said, we flash forward to today. Um, and so we look at the self-custody of cryptocurrency. If you hold your cryptocurrency on any exchange, I don't care if it's Coinbase, I don't care if it's Cash App, I don't care if it's the Black Wall Street um, wallet. If you let an exchange hold on to your cryptocurrency, you are allowing yourself to be at the mercy of both regulations and hackers. Because if all of a sudden America says, hey, it's illegal to have cryptocurrency, the first place they're going to target are the exchanges because the exchanges have to comply with the government. And so if you want to be self-sovereign, if you want the freedom to not have to you know, deal with the government or the banks and you want to have your freedom to be able to travel throughout the entire world with real world value, then you want to make sure you put your cryptocurrency on a cold wallet. You can do it through like a Trezor or through a Nano, uh, Nano Ledger S or X. And this way you can take your money off the internet and put it onto cold storage. Once you can do stuff like that, then that gives you the self-sovereignty that we're all looking for. Um, because as of right now, they're trying to figure out ways to stop these small countries. When I say they, I mean like the big countries such as America, maybe China, um, they're looking at ways to stop all of this, you know, value being passed throughout the entire world um, digitally without it being, you know, 
backed by any governments. It's really bad for governments. It's really bad for banks. And so they're trying to figure out a way to stop this. Either A, they're probably going to start a war and try to, you know, by force stop it. Or B, they're going to let it happen. And then they're probably going to try to, you know, buy as much of the cryptocurrency that they possibly can for themselves. And so either way, you want to make sure that you take your cryptocurrency off the exchanges and put it on a cold wallet. I don't know how else to express that. That's probably the most important thing that I've said this entire time. Um, I've been pretty accurate with um, the things I've said. Um, this is the third full length cryptocurrency explanation I've given. In the first one I gave, I pretty much predicted the, the rise of, of Bitcoin when it was around like 13,000 and hit 19 and it came all the way down to four um, over the course of a few years. And I predict that it would come right back up. So I'm pretty accurate with this when I was working on the railroad. I had a, a accuracy rate of about 99.7%. And good was considered 80%. And so I'm very, very accurate with this stuff. So I'm telling you, please get your money off the exchanges. Take your crypto off the exchanges. Put it on your cold wallet, a Trezor or a Nano. If you're not sure how to do that, you can go to u.sunjoin.com. Um, that's where I have my tax classes. But Lamar Wilson also has a cryptocurrency 101 class that walks you through this entire process. Um, so that's very important. Um, couple other things i know a couple questions have come up they people have said well i can't afford a bitcoin it costs too much um so let me give you some of the the metrics of this so there's 21 million bitcoins to ever be created as of right now there's over 43 million millionaires in the entire world meaning there's not enough bitcoins for every millionaire to even own one half of a bitcoin so if you own half of a bitcoin essentially just know that that purchasing power one day will equal a millionaire status. That's the first piece to it. 21 million Bitcoins to ever be created versus the US dollar. They keep printing it. I believe they printed like 30% of this, the world's supply um, during COVID. And so, um, you know, inflation is happening. Inflation meaning prices are going up or the quality of goods and services are coming down. They can hit you either way. Both of those are considered inflation. And with only 21 million Bitcoins to ever be created, it takes that out of the picture because it's a scarce asset. So the value of your scarce asset will only go, go up over time. It's like having land in Manhattan. You can't create new land. So as time goes on, the value of that property only continues to go up. Um, Lamar Wilson, shout out to Lamar for that example. Um, so 21 million Bitcoins to ever be created. And then in every single Bitcoin, you have 100 million pieces of a Bitcoin. So just like there's a, a hundred pennies to $1, there are 100 million Satoshis to one Bitcoin. And so people are like, man, a whole Bitcoin is about 40,000. I don't have 40,000 to buy a whole one. However, you can buy a thousand Satoshis for 40 cents. So the, the goal is to stack up as many Satoshis as possible because that's like buying into a scarce asset, it's like buying into Manhattan real estate before it becomes big. It's, it, you're at the early stages, we're only 12 years in, just like with the internet, it's like buying into the internet in 1995. So you can buy domains, um, you can go to like unstoppabledomains.com, you can buy um, different domains there, you can buy different trademarks to market your businesses. Um, there's a whole different, there's a whole another world out there Instead of it just being .com, you got .cryptos, .bitcoin, .eth, .shop, .club. You know, you got all these different domains now that we can utilize. And, you know, it's just like the gold rush back in 1949. Everybody moving to California to, you know, get gold. Um, well, now everybody should be trying to get this with Bitcoin. Um, but just like, like I said, in 1933, America said, hey, you got to give us all your gold. You know, that's less than 100 years after the gold rush. So they might do the same thing with this cryptocurrency stuff. And so you want to make sure you put everything on your cold wallet. Um, so that's the majority of stuff that I've been, you know, talking about on my tour. Um, you've got different wallets. Um, you've got Cash App, which is the easiest way to buy Bitcoin. Um, now we have the Black Wall Street wallet, which was created by Hill Harper and Naja Roberts. That was the whole purpose for the tour. Um, it's brand new still. I still believe there's still some kinks to be worked out. However, when it comes to this cryptocurrency thing, um, I, I spend money for two reasons, for, for price 
and for purchase. And so I buy my Bitcoin for the price because, you know, I want my value to go up over time. Um, but then I also do things for purpose. So I buy Ethereum, which is an altcoin, because I want to support people in the NFT world. NFTs are an upgrade to collectibles where um, like creatives can create their own price points for their art. Because like Nipsey Hussle had done with, with Crenshaw, he said, hey, look, my art's worth more than just 129 on iTunes. I'm going to sell my album for $100, but I'm going to make it scarce. And so with NFTs, you can essentially do the same type of ordeal. And if you are an artist, whether it's a painting, whether it's digital art, whether it's a musician, you can now create your own price points with the NFTs and have ownership of it. And if somebody decides to resell your work, so say you create a, a digital painting and then one of the people who bought it, they resell it in the smart contract, you can say, hey, I want 20% or whatever price point that you want of every resale and then collect on every resale of your art. And so I think NFTs are huge. Um, so I buy Ethereum not for the price, but I buy it for the purpose. It's the same reason why I use the Black Wall Street wallet app, because that money is supposed to be flowing through all the different um, black communities from my understanding Hill was saying that he gave um, some of the some of the proceeds to the to the survivors of the Black Wall Street massacre in 1921 I wasn't taught about this in school but in 1921 um, the US government dropped bombs on the most successful black city in the entire country um, out of just jealousy hate or whatnot it was not the only massacre that happened in this country that happened all over the entire country is that black wall street was the most successful and we have three current survivors um to this day that are still alive from that from over 100 years ago and so on the tour i met up with two of them in tulsa um, which is right where biden was speaking um as well as angela rye as well as um sheila e sheila lee jackson um so it was a really great experience, but when you delve into it, especially when you look at, when we listen to my podcast about Tulsa, Oklahoma, you'll see we have a long way to go. Um, but yeah, so I I buy for purchase. I mean, I buy, I buy for price and I buy for pur purpose. I buy Bitcoin for the price so my value goes up and I buy Ethereum and a couple other alts for purpose. I buy from Cash App. I buy from the Black Wall Street wallet. Um, right now, I do it through Cash App because you can't move anything from the Black Wall Street wallet to your to your cold wallet. So I still get it on Cash App. However, as the development goes on with the app, I will sl start to gradually move uh, more and more to the Black Wall Street wallet um, as as it starts to improve. And so that's pretty much my first episode. Um, all the other ones will be going over you know, the different cities I went to. Today is actually my birthday, June 16th. So I'm really excited about this episode. Um, the The audio podcast won't be released until July. So you guys are a little early on it. Um, but yeah, CJ the Smart Guy, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram, Twitter. Um, you're watching this on YouTube. Make sure you hit the, the like and subscribe button because this is only the beginning. Um, Isaiah Jackson, he basically said, hey, look, we're all going to get together with his Bitcoin and Black America. Lamar said, you know what? We're going to get everybody interactive with the Black Bitcoin Billionaires Club. And then Naja said, we're going to go out to the communities. And they're all looking at me as the, the cryptocurrency CPA. So I'm honored to be a part of this. And yeah, CJ the Smart Guy, I'm out. The marathon continues. Chuch. Entrepreneur, period.